Okay. 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 So referring to uh, seven two two. Um, okay. Now. Um, Now, oh, so what you can do is since um, so each Lagrange polynomial is a product of uh, linear factors of uh, this form, like x minus x j, um, or I think that is i um, for i not equal to j. Um, so then, um, so one MATLAB function you can use is called cons. To uh, multiply polynomials. Um, each factor. Um, Because remember, we're dealing with polynomials in MATLAB, so each poly a polynomial is represented as a row vector of coefficients. So, so a factor like this, x minus xi. So if I want to represent it as a row vector of its coefficients, highest degree first. What would that vector? What what what, what would that vector be? Highest, highest first. first. Um, uh, N would be the first. Or, or the. Wasn't it just the coefficient attached to the highest degree? Yeah, it's only the coefficients. Right. So it's going to be whatever is attached to X sub uh, N. Um. But, but think of this as here we have a polynomial of degree one. Okay. So in terms of pol polynomial coefficients, what's the highest degree coefficient of this polynomial? If that one's degree one, I guess one. Yeah, yeah, because you have one times x. So you're making a vector, and the first element would be the one for the x. And then what would the other coefficient be? Zero? No. OK, OK. Sorry. Can you, can you explain one more time? OK. Remember, xi is some constant value. Mm -hmm. Just some number. So right. So here we have this first degree polynomial. So, so it's x is a first degree term. Right. Where you're putting all the coefficients of this polynomial in here ordered from highest degree to lowest. Right. So, what's the, what, so, you, so you, you got the degree one coefficient, so the degree zero coefficient, the constant term, is what has to go in here in the other spot. So what would, what would that be? Negative one. Oh, well, negative, yes, but not one. But remember, each of these x values, they're treated as if they're constants. So just some sort of con, like n or c or. Oh, it's it's literally this. Oh, okay, I see. What you're, okay, so x sub i. Yeah. Sub i. Yeah. 
So that's how you form one linear factor. And then you can use con. Con is it's, it's short for convolution. But, and this is discussed in the, in the, toward the end of the tutorial, the list of polynomial functions. Mm -hmm. This can be used to multiply two polynomials. Um, so you can use that to multiply factors like these, like in a loop. Um, okay. To, and, and then um, now, keep in mind, I just called x of i. But don't forget indexing conventions. Um, MATLAB is one based indexing. Um, but the way I've described these points, like in text, is uh, starting from zero. So that ha that should be taken into account. Um, so you're getting a vector coming in of n plus one x values. Okay. Um, also, it's not okay. Um, is a I guess I need to. I said something here that was technically incorrect. Scaled product of linear factors. Um, so th this accounts for just the numerator. Um, but there's also a denominator, but that's easier because uh, that's just a product of numbers. So you're looking at a product of um, xj minus xi from i going to from over all possible indices um, i not equal j. Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, but here you're just multiplying numbers. Um, so then you so, so then you just divide by that when you're done. Uh, so that's how you can form. That's one way of forming Lagrange polynomials from these given x's. Um, so then, if you're going to have a loop, like okay, it'd be a for loop that would um, repeatedly multiply these to accumulate the entire Lagrange polynomial. Well, that polynomial that you're accumulating has to start, you have to set it equal to something to start. Like, so for example, when you're, when you have a sum, like uh, for one of the examples from a tutorial, a uh, compute mean, you're adding up all the elements of X to compute the mean. So you set, you set your sum equal to zero initially when you added on all of the X's. Here, it's similar. You have to set your, poly your Lagrange polynomial equal to something as a starting point, and then you multiply with all these x's. Um, so there's a similar kind of accumulation going on. So think about that. Um, so that's, that's one approach. Um, the other approach um, is use a different MATLAB function, polyfit. Uh, so, so using so that will um, use interpolation um, that each Lagrange polynomial is equal to zero at all of the x's. Oops. Except for, um, okay, it makes it a little more precise. The, um, the J Lagrange polynomial is equal to zero at all the XIs except for XJ, where it's equal to one. So, what does polyfit need? Polyfit requires a vector of X's, which you have. It requires a vector of y's to go with the x's. Well, all of those would be zero, except that one of them is equal to one. Um, and then you specify the degree. The degree would be n. Um, so that's a way to just um, fill in the, uh, uh, to, to, to obtain the coefficients of a Lagrange polynomial. So I don't care which way you use. Um, and you probably find this way easier, but. Um, Whatever, so, um, so whatever you want to do there. Um, and then once you have 
each Lagrange polynomial, then um, as described in the problem, your output is a matrix. And each row of a matrix is a coefficient of one of these Lagrange polynomials. Um, so you'll have, since you have n plus one x values coming in, it'll be a n plus one by n plus one matrix. Um, when you build up as a Grange polynomial, however, however you do it, it's, it's going to be a row vector. Um, so then I'll make a note here. How to access or change an entire row of a matrix. Um, let's see. Um, uh, one point two point nine is where uh, that's introduced. <coughs> Regardless of which approach you use here. Questions about that? Or anything else related to the homework? Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? Okay. Now, continuing on, now I've mentioned uh, Chebyshev points before, <coughs> um, so now I'm going to return to that. Um, I get, I've done an example where um, if you you use polynomial interpolation of equally spaced X's and high degree, but it can go badly. So by choosing different X's that are at Chebyshev points, um, that uh, you can improve your approximation greatly. So now I'm going to go into more detail uh, about that. Um, okay, and I just realized I've not yet assigned problems for these. And whenever I, um, teach out of out of my own book, I find myself accidentally giving away the answers to some homework problems that I assign. And um, I want to be a little more careful about that. Um, OK. Um, Okay. Now, um, picking up where we left off from last time, if we could obtain the interpolating polynomial Pn of x, we're approximating some function f of x. Um, we have a formula for that that I proved in a rather strange way last time. Um, so we have the n plus first derivative at some unknown point over n plus one factorial. And then we have a product x minus each of the x values. OK. Now, so what has been shown is that um, this error can get large. So um, is there anything that we can do about that to try to uh, keep this error, um, at least you know, try to make it smaller? Now, this part of the error formula that deals with the n plus first derivative um, of f, um, there's not really much we can do about that, because this is just depends on the particular function you have. Um, and there's going to be all kinds of functions out there that happen to have large derivatives. But this part here, the, the product of all these linear factors, this has nothing to do with your f. It's only about the x values. 
So the goal is to choose these x values to keep this product from the error formula Uh, we can try to keep it small. Um, now, we may not be able to uh, you know, find an actual minimum of it, um, but there's something fairly simple we can do to at least impose a bound, an upper bound, on this uh, product. Um, so, what's the approach? So the approach will be this. Uh, we're going to choose and to be a polynomial, to be a root um, that is bounded on an interval containing these points. Okay. Um, now, to keep things simple, let's assume we're approximating this function f on the interval minus 1 to 1. And if we're dealing with a different interval, that's no problem. We can just scale and shift, as we've seen in other uh, contexts, um, to work with whatever interval we have. OK. Um, so, um, so now we're working in this interval. I'm going to find the Chebyshev polynomial of degree um, degree k to be the following. tk of x is equal to cosine of k times inverse cosine of x for x between minus 1 and 1. Okay. Out of curiosity, have either of you, uh, I've heard of you, any of you, um, been exposed to Chebyshev polynomials before, like from some other class? Or are you totally alien? The name is familiar, but... I'm not awesome. sure. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Because <laughs> honestly, I'm, I'm racking my brain. Like, I'm trying to think of whatever class they would come up in uh, outside of a numerical analysis class. And numerical analysis, they have many, many uses. Um, but, okay. Because there, there are also so many names floating out there, and some sound similar. Like, we have, well, in this class alone, we've seen Lagrange. We'll also see Legendre. Those get confused a lot. Um, so, <sighs> okay. Um, now, what seems rather strange is I call this a polynomial. That doesn't really look like a polynomial at all. Um, but at least when we're, when we're look, dealing with x between minus 1 and 1, which is the domain of inverse cosine, it actually is a polynomial. Um, and I'm going to prove that to you now. And in the process, end up doing one of the homework problems. I had to make sure to not assign. Um, so, if I look at the first couple of values of k, so t zero of x. If I plug in k equals zero, you tell me what this would simplify to. Just ready to dust off your trig.
What's cosine of zero? Isn't it just Yes, it's one. <laughs> Thank you, Caitlin, for not risking the echo. <laughs> um, I should mention that um, I, I found it kind of sadly amusing that uh, of your your uh, many predecessors among GTAs here, um, they're perfectly fine if you're of course, teaching college algebra or even calculus, but you sign them to teach trig, and they're like, ugh. <laughs> so, uh, it seems to be a, a one thing that gets forgotten. Um, and so this will be a nice review for all of you. Um, OK, so that's uh, all right. So that's a polynomial degree zero. Um, and then if I look at T1, uh, if I plug in K equal one, what will that what will it simplify to? So here we're getting into how inverse functions behave. Um, so if you're taking cosine of inverse cosine of x by setting k equal 1, what will that become? Just, Just x. x. Yeah, but the functions essentially cancel out and you get x. Um, and uh, this is something that I'm not even sure where in our math curriculum this is even covered like when I at other schools where I've taught in the calculus sequence, I think it'd be like in Cal 2 where I talk in depth about inverse functions uh, because uh, it's important to talk about it for you know, inverse trig functions, but also how the exponential logarithmic functions are inverses of each other. Um, I'm not even sure if that gets uh, much coverage here at, at USM. And um, so it's an unfortunate blind spot for a lot of students. Um, so yeah, so here, just like when you have square and square root, inverse functions of one another, they, they cancel each other out in a sense. All right, so we have so far two polynomials. Now, it's going to be a lot harder. If I set k equal 2 or higher, it's going to take a whole lot more work uh, for indiv each individual case to show the polynomial. But fortunately, I don't have to do that. Um, so for k greater than 1, um, I have trig identities uh, to show you and um, identities. Um, actually, one of my colleagues pointed out that even though there are a lot of trig identities out there, there are really only three that you need to know. Um, of course, there's one, probably the one trig identity that most students remember, maybe the only one, cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Um, and then also taking a, cosine or sine of a sum or difference because so many other trig identities can be derived from those so if, if you at least know those you're in good shape and that's what we're going to use here for ones for cosine okay so i have a cosine a plus B is equal to cosine A, cosine B, minus, so whatever sign you have here, you get the opposite here, sine A, sine B. Um, okay. And then if I just change um, plus to minus, that just changes the sign uh, right here. Okay, so I'm going to use this. Um, with particular choices of A and B. So this part on the inside here, cos inverse cosine of X. Um, then I can write TK of X equal to cosine of k theta. OK. Um, whoops, don't want that there. OK. So 
So now I'm going to um, define t k plus one of x. So that'd be cosine of k plus one theta. And then similarly, I have a t k minus one of x, and that'd be cosine k minus one theta. Um, so I think of a as being k theta and uh, b as just being theta. So I'll fill that in. And then he, so b would just be theta. And then similarly over here. Okay. Now, so now I'm going to simplify this. Um, okay. Okay, now cosine k theta, that's just tk. So I'll fill that in. So tk of x. Okay. Cosine theta, can you tell me how that is simplified? Or how would I express that in terms of x? The audio cut out the worst possible moment. X? x? Yes. <laughs> it does that a lot. Uh, I'll just write it over on the other side. So, okay. Okay. And uh, let's see, I'll go ahead and remove these since those are just a way to write tk plus one tk minus one okay so now we have these relationships between consecutive polynomials in the sequence now we don't really know what those these are but it doesn't matter because what i'm going to do now is i'm just going to add these equations so then all the sign terms will cancel out so I have t k plus one plus t of x plus t k minus one of x is equal to, so these combine, these cancel and I get two x t k of x. So now if I assume that I already have t k minus one and t k and I want the next polynomial in the sequence, then I can just rearrange. So each new Chebyshev polynomial is equal to 2x times the previous one minus one before that. And what we call that is a three term recurrence relation. So anytime you have a sequence of uh, there's a sequence of polynomials in this case, but uh, other sequences too, where each one depends on the previous two. Um, so that's called a three term recurrence relation because there's three terms involved altogether. Um, so, so this is how we can uh, easily generate um, uh, more Chebyshev polynomials, however many we need. So if I do like a T2 of X, so that's the, ne the next one sequence. So that would be 2x times t1, which is x, 
minus um, the previous one, which is one. So that's two X squared minus one. And then I'll do one more, T three of X. So that would be two um, X times T two, which is this, minus T one, which would be X. So then if you simplify all of that, you're gonna get four uh, X cubed minus uh, 2x. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, just for fun, I'll do one more. T4. Okay, so that'd be 2x times T3 minus T2. All right, so then we combine all of that. So we have, um, okay, so 8x to the 4 minus 4x squared minus 2x squared uh, plus 1. All right. Um, you may see a pattern in the leading coefficients. That will be the subject of a homework problem. Um, also notice that if the index of a Chebyshev polynomial is even, we only have even degree terms. If, and if the uh, index is odd, then we only have odd degree terms. Okay. I have to check again to make sure I don't accidentally do a homework problem that I intend to assign. Okay. <laughs> so, um, so roots. Okay. So, um, so once we have a way, now we have a way to change the polynomials. Um, So to construct uh, P n of X, um, using a Chebyshev polynomial, what you do is you can set X zero up to X n, so these n plus one points, to be the roots of T n plus one of X. Because you need n plus one points, so you need a polynomial degree n plus one to get them. Um, okay. If you're interpolating on minus one to one, otherwise you shift and scale roots to whatever general interval a b you're working with. So if you're interpolating on different interval. All right. Now, so one thing I need to address is why does this help at all? Um, because um, if I look at this part of the error formula, so x minus each of the roots of a Chebyshev polynomial degree n plus one. Um, we have uh, this. If I multiply this out, that's a polynomial whose leading coefficient is going to be one. Um, so, um, in other words, it's called a monic polynomial. So a monic polynomial has leading coefficient of one. But If I were to, so if these are the roots of Tn plus one, okay. Now, 
what I've written here is not entirely correct. So if these upper roots, so this makes up a factorization of Tn plus 1. But as I said, this has a leading coefficient of 1 if I were to multiply these out. But as we see here, we do not have a leading coefficient of 1. What is the leading coefficient? I, so I need to put something right here to indicate what the leading coefficient should be. So based on the examples that you see here for T2, T3, T4, what in general is leading coefficient? Two, two. To the power of k minus one. It is a power of two, but not. Um, okay, if you're saying that that's the leading coefficient of t t k, then yes. Um, okay, so very good. Um, and and here k is n plus one, so that would be uh, two to the n. All right. Um, OK, now, but the thing is, this is also equal to cosine of n plus 1 inverse cosine of x. So, um, OK. How big can that be? And how, how, how big can cosine get? Really, somebody remembers this from trig. What are the was the range of values of cosine. Isn't that yeah, so, um, so this cannot be any bigger than one. So now we're really interested in magnitude here. Um, okay, so I put absolute values around everything. All right, so since this being a cosine, and this is actually the motivation for defining polynomials this way, is less or equal to one, then what I can do is I can rearrange this inequality to get an upper bound on these linear factors. An absolute value. So, what can I say? This I, now this is important because this is a key part of my error formula. The only part I really have any control over. So, what can I say? This is bounded by. One over one. t to the n, which approaches zero. Bingo. One over two to the n. So yeah, you would you would hope that as you increase the degree of your tripling polynomial, that um, your polynomial should converge to f of x. But for a general choice of uh, interpolation points of your x's, uh, that's actually not true. Um, that because the error can get so large. But at least with Chebyshev points. You do have um, at least this part of the error formula. It really is going to zero as n goes to infinity. That does, but it can still be a problem because you have that other part of the error formula, the n plus first derivative of f. So if f is particularly nasty, that can still get out of hand. But at least this gives you, um, this helps you out to some extent with keeping that that error low. Um, now, if you are working with a different interval, not to not minus one to one. But general interval AB, then um, you get an extra factor in here. Uh, it'd be like a B minus A 
all raised to the n plus one. Um, but um, but still, uh, at least because we are working with a polynomial that is bounded on an interval containing your x values, that helps us at least control part of the error formula. Um, now, I should mention that because if we look at the, the definition here, um, I mentioned that this only applies for x between minus 1 and 1 because that's a domain of inverse cosine. If x goes outside of this interval, this definition no longer applies. There is an alternative definition for that case um, that uses um, hyperbolic cosine um, and inverse hyperbolic cosine. So there is a definition of Chebyshev polynomials on the whole real line. The problem is uh, outside of the interval minus one to one, uh, where it's bounded, Chebyshev polynomials grow really, really fast and therefore completely useless to us uh, as far as um, uh, keeping error small. Um, but at least within this interval, they're fine. Um, now, I've also mentioned that our x values are chosen to be the roots. Um, that's not the only option. You can also choose them to be uh, the extrema, because since um, Chebyshev polynomial is a cosine, it's going to be oscillating between minus 1 and 1. Um, so, uh, so, so one option is to choose the roots, another is to choose the extrema. The extrema is nice if you want to... Um, have the endpoints included um, of, your, of your, the endpoints of your interval included as your x's, because uh, these points, your, these roots of t n plus one, they will be in the interior of minus one to one. Uh, they, they won't include either of the endpoints. All right. So, so questions about what happened here. So, um, so when you have a choice like this, like like being able to interpolate a function at whatever x values, the choice of x values can make quite a difference. Um, and uh, so here with a goal of trying to keep this product of linear factors bounded, and we think, well, what's a function that's bounded, a sine or a cosine? Uh, that's what motivated the um, formulation of uh, Chebyshev polynomials. Um, it's just nice that we could use trig identities to uh, uh, be able to um, uh, work with that. Okay, now, um, I actually have in mind this topic for the whole week, but I've already covered quite a bit just today. Um, so what I'm going to do is, um, uh, I'm actually done with covering new stuff for today, but I will have more. I'll go work of a MATLAB side of things on uh, Wednesday. Um, but uh, I strongly encourage you to uh, do what you can to uh, continue making progress on um, the 7172 homework, and I will be coming up with problems for 7.4 uh, for, for the next assignment, so that um, we can uh, use some time on uh, Wednesday uh, to uh, handle more questions. <clears throat> um, does anyone have any questions now, or is, are we good for now? Well, I think we all just want to get out of here earlier. <laughs> Okay, then. Um, let me stop the recording. <laughs>